As we move on now and throughout our episode, one of the breakthroughs in food and agriculture has been the development of sensors. We live in the internet of things, especially through this pandemic. We've been really seeing that. And this is as true on the farm as it is on the grocery store. So our next guest is a federal research scientist at the Ottawa Research and Development Centre, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. She specializes in remote sensing technology and her research focuses on the use of synthetic aperture radar satellites to monitor the condition of crops and soils. Please welcome Heather McNairn, research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Heather. And I think our screen is just popping up shortly. Yeah, that's great. Hopefully you can hear me. Let me just share my we screen. We hear you great. Excellent. Okay. Perfect. I see your screen. Excellent. Um, uh, it's interesting. I was listening very carefully to what Christopher was talking about, and I, I hope that you will see a, a great deal of synergy between uh, what he's doing at a slightly different scale than what, what we're working on. Um, as, I, as I was introduced, I'm a research scientist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, so uh, I have a small research team in, in Ottawa, um, and I'm going to focus most of my presentation today on a very specific uh, project we're working on with uh, Canadian industry, uh, a company called AUG Signals, uh, which is sort of a big data uh, processing company in Toronto. Um, so before we begin, I'll just give a little bit of a uh, intro into uh, what we're talking about here in terms of um, Earth observation uh, monitoring from space. So of course, we're gathering information data about uh, physical, chemical, uh, biological systems. I think the, the previous presentations uh, showed that. Uh, the scale, we can mount them in situ, drones, airplanes, um, or space-based uh, orbiting satellites. And in fact, there are even sensors uh, and, and cameras on the International Space uh, Station. Uh, so what these satellites are orbiting the Earth uh, multiple times a day, gathering very timely, accurate, and relevant information. So I want to show, share with you uh, what some of the research and operations within the federal government are doing uh, based on this space-based data. Uh, we're seeing a real paradigm shift. I've been in the business for a couple of decades now or more, and um, things are, are really accelerating. And so what is causing this acceleration? Well, we have a lot more satellites that are available, um, many of them from public uh, space agencies, but also the private sector are launching uh, many, many satellites and, and selling data from those satellites. Um, there is a lot more free and open data. Google. Uh, uh, Google Earth is a really good example of that. Uh, so a lot of free and open data uh, from space, especially from government satellite operators like space agencies. We're seeing unprecedented, uh, unprecedented advancements in engineering. So Christopher talked about multispectral, hyperspectral data. Uh, we now have data from space at very, very high resolutions. Uh, so a few centimeters in, in resolution. Uh, cloud computing and big data, a lot, of it, a lot of work being done on advanced algorithms like AI, machine learning. I'm going to show you some examples of that. And, and just a growing appreciation from clients and end users in terms of uh, what can be done with this, this data from space. And on this slide, I'm just showing a really old but great example um, from free data that, that the U.S. provides, uh, a satellite called the Thematic Mapper from Landsat. Uh, showing how space can dramatically um, map uh, drought conditions. So here you can see an example from Alberta um, of the sort of devastation in, um, uh, in, in drought conditions in, in this region of, of Canada. Uh, so what can we do? Uh, well, one thing I wanted to, to highlight, we do have at Agriculture and Agriculture Canada an operational activity. It's called the Annual Crop Inventory. Um, so this has been operational for more than 10 years. Uh, so every year, our department maps what crop is grown in every field across Canada. Um, the, res the maps are produced at a 30 meter resolution. Um, they're all based on satellite data and they are posted on the open data portal. And the bottom left uh, image here, you can see an example of that. The legend is too small to see, uh, but we're mapping um, all of the major and minor crops across Canada every single year and providing those maps uh, free and open. 
Um, but the research is doing a lot of other things uh, besides just identifying what crops are being grown. We're also developing methods that will use satellites to tell us how much water is in the, the top part of the soil. So you see an example in the middle image in this slide uh, from satellite data mapping in blue areas where soils are wetter. Uh, we also are developing um, algorithms that tell us how much biomass uh, is present in the field from satellite data, what the leaf area of a particular crop is, um, and even uh, things like what the crop condition is. And uh, we're working with Canadian industry to develop from satellites a method to identify phenology or growth stage. Um, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. And in the bottom uh, right image, this is some new research that we've just started using satellites to flag when fields are being tilled or, or crops are being harvested uh, from, from satellite data. We're using a range of methods, so uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, basic classification, and all kinds of models, including data assimilation into more complex um, land surface models. So I don't have time to talk about all of this, so I just picked one um, activity that I thought would be of most interest. Um, and this is what we're calling our disease risk tool. Uh, so Christopher talked about identifying disease in the field. And the question is, how do you know if a field or a region of Canada is at a higher risk of disease occurring? So how do you flag regions or fields so you can go and kind of dick uh, kick the dirt around and, and, um, and, and take a look whether disease is actually present. Uh, so the disease that we started focusing on a few years ago was sclerotinia in, in canola. So canola is a pretty important crop for Canada, um, about $9.3 billion worth of exports of, of products uh, from canola um, for the Canadian economy. So sclerotinia is a, is a fungus that can significantly reduce uh, productivity in, in canola fields by up to 50%. Um, and just as an example, in uh, 2010, this was a, a loss of $600 million uh, for Canadian producers because of this, this disease. Uh, the example I'm gonna show you is, is looking at sclerotinia, but we're also uh, starting a phase two where we're going to be looking at uh, satellites to help inform about other diseases or risk of other diseases like fusarium, um, club root, and, and a few others as well. So focusing on sclerotinia, if you look at the middle uh, slide here, there are a number of risk factors uh, of whether this pathogen will take a foothold in a field, what is the cropping history? So specifically, when was the last time canola was planted in this field? Whether there was a history of disease of sclerotinia in the field, the cropping density, um, whether the soils have been persistently wet um, or near saturation over a period of time, uh, what is the weather forecast specifically in terms of how wet we expect it to be and whether the, the pathogen has been um, spotted in the region. And we also know that the risk of this pathogen taking a foothold is crop type specific. Um, so really key, key factors, um, as I was mentioning, is, is the wetness. So if we have uh, regular rains that have occurred in the last uh, two weeks, uh, just when the canola starts to begin to flower or through its flowering stages, um, we're, you know, we expect that this infection could occur. Um, and that um, if, can, if the conditions continue through the flowering of canola, um, then the, the consequences of this disease, disease can be quite significant. So on the right-hand side, I'm gonna pull this all together in a minute, but on the right-hand side, you see some of the contributions from space. So we can identify the cropping history from space. Uh, when was the last year canola was planted in this field? Um, I talked about surface wetness, so we can tell from satellites and, and assimilation into models how wet soil has been and for how long it's been wet. And uh, from satellites as well, when is canola flowering? So I'm just gonna walk you through a few examples. Um, so this is an example from our annual crop inventory. I mentioned it's been running for the last uh, more than 10 years now. Um, and this is just an example from Manitoba. It's, it's not canola, it's, so, it's soybeans, but you can see from 2009 onward, the uh, sort of the spread of, of soybeans um, across uh, the province of Manitoba. So that's all being derived from satellite data. So that tells us something about the cropping history. 
Uh, I also talked about how wet uh, soils are. So again, I talked about uh, our ability to derive surface wetness from satellite, uh, satellite data. So this is an example working with um, Environment and Climate Change Canada, where we're assimilating satellite data into land surface models, and then we're able to estimate the volume of water in the top part of the soil. Environment Canada is producing these sort of pilot data sets to us. So every hour, they're providing us with an estimate of how much water is in the surface part of the soil. Um, and then we use some soil, other soils data to um, bring this to percent of field capacity. And then we can watch over time, over the last two weeks, how long has the soil stayed persistently wet? Um, so again, that's a risk factor if that soil stays um, wet or near saturation for an extended period of time. Um, and the last piece of the puzzle from space is um, identifying the phenology or the growth stage of the canola. So this is a project with, again, with Canadian industry, taking satellite data into a machine learning algorithm and watching uh, when the canola starts to flower. So the cool thing about this particular method, and there's a paper here you, you can read up on it, is that with um, with the satellite data, the machine learning algorithm, and, and, uh, and inputs of growing degree days, we can um, not only identify what the growth stage of the, the crop is, but when we expect that particular field of canola to flower. So we can uh, run through this sort of scenario here and watch when the canola, these, these are four test fields that you see here for this particular research project, and identifying that, for example, on July the 4th, that three out of our four test fields um, have now started to flower. And then we can continue to watch the change in the phenology through the, the season. So we only have five discrete dates here, but this actual, this is a viewer that the company has produced and it will run on a daily time step. So every day you can uh, get an estimate of what the growth stage of that particular field is on that particular day. Uh, so just a couple more slides here to kind of tie this all together. And it links really nicely with, again, with what Christopher was talking about. Um, so again, this is what we're calling our disease risk tool, DIRT. Um, in the very middle of the graph, you see, uh, or the middle of this, uh, this slide, you see um, a graphic uh, that looks like a map. So we have a prototype running where we are integrating all of these geospatial data. So cropping history, um, what the growth stage is, how wet the soils are, uh, this tool also allows producers to input information like disease risk in their fields, cropping density, um, information on uh, whether disease is present in the region as well. So we had a prototype we developed under a uh, previous research project that creates these geospatial maps, and it will tell you based on your particular um, circumstance in that particular field, whether uh, the risk of this particular pathogen, sclerotinia, could, um, uh, could be present in your field. So here we're not predicting the presence of the disease, but we are, um, we are sort of bringing the storyline together about whether that particular field um, could potentially be at risk, and that would alert a producer or a service provider to go out and, and, um, and check. And I think one of the previous speakers talked about that, about sort of organizing your, uh, you know, your resources so that you know where you want to go and check when. Um, so particularly, like I said, when the scler when when the canola is is flowering is the time you really want to check this out. Uh, so the sources of data on the left hand side, I won't go into a lot of details, but we're using satellites from many different um, countries and sources, including Canadian satellites a variety of different algorithms that I, I mentioned, producing a range of different um, uh, map products, geospatial products, integrating them in uh, to this web tool. Um, and then hopefully that will help to inform um, this alerting and, and action in the field. So this is currently a prototype that we're building. It's not live on the web yet. The intent we hope uh, when we get this up and running would be to provide geospatial maps over the Canadian prairies um, on a, at least a daily time step. Um, and the resolution right now we're running at is 100 meters. So it's at a field scale. 
And I'll just wrap up with a few takeaway messages here. So um, space provides a really great way to, uh, to monitor uh, what's happening on agricultural resources. I showed you an example of uh, disease risk assessment or um, this disease risk tool, but uh, we're doing a lot of other things with, with space as well. Um, so we can identify what crops are being grown where. As I said, we have an operational system now for 10 years to produce these maps from satellites. Um, we have a method we're developing right now, which will tell us um, how productive um, crops are. Um, as you can see, we can tell what the growth stage of different crops are, um, the state of available water in the top part of the soil, um, and even what soil conservation practices uh, farmers are using in terms of uh, tillage and, and, um, and other um, uh, conservation practices. Uh, so these data uh, can serve to help target um, and measure the success of policies and programs, or as we're talking about kind of organizing our resources to know um, when and where we need to deploy uh, these resources. Um, so we're working with Canadian industry um, as well as some of our sister departments. And I showed this one example of our disease risk tool. Um, so the key to our success, and I think this has been mentioned as well, is to work across these sectors. So working across government labs, um, academia, industry, um, and other domains as well. I'm a re remote sensing um, scientist, so it's important that I integrate myself with the user community, um, data scientists, um, and, and algorithm developers as well. Um, no nation can do it alone, and as I showed you, we're working with data from many, many different um, satellite data operators, so um, there's a lot of international collaboration that is going um, on as well. So I, I, with that, I will close, but uh, happy to take any questions if, if you have any.